a very good morning to all from the Indian National Academy of Engineering, uh, those who are present here on the occasion of the National Science Day. To begin the proceedings of the day today, let me invite Professor Indranil Manna, President INA, to welcome you all and invite today's speaker on this very special occasion, that is Professor U.V. Desai, on a very contemporary topic of importance, which is universally applicable. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Colonel Rai. Um, good morning to one and all, and especially Professor Uday Desai, the Vice President of INE, and also today's uh, very esteemed speaker. Uh, National Science Day is a very major landmark in the uh, science and technology map of the country. Uh, this is to celebrate the phenomenal and a very landmark discovery of Sir C. V. Raman. But before I actually uh, introduce the reason as to why this is very important to us, even in Indian National Academy of Engineering, I would like to just make a mention that uh, INE uh, religiously celebrates the three very important days in our calendar, namely the National Science Day on 28th of February, then 11th of May, the Technology Day, and 15th September, the National Engineers Day. Uh, engineering is all about translation of the fundamental into application, uh, and engineering is deeply entrenched in the uh, laws and uh, various theories and principles of science. At times, engineering and technology actually helps to establish the uh, predictions or the theories of science. One very bright example would be uh, the 2016 LIGO experiment that proved the existence of gravitational wave, which was predicted by Einstein more than 100, almost 100, exactly 100 years ago. 1916 was the basic theory. The same thing applies here uh, when uh, Sir C. V. Raman uh, reported uh, on February 28th, uh, 1928, the existence of uh, inelastic scattering, which would be very usefully uh, applied for a spectroscopic application of material characterization. Uh, this was a very uh, landmark uh, discovery which was celebrated and recognized by way of awarding him the Nobel Prize in 1930. And this is also another example. The theory was actually propounded by a German physicist, Adolf Schmeckel, in 1923. And uh, uh, Sir Raman, along with his uh, very uh, illustrious student, K. S. Krishnan, reported uh, the existence of uh, inelastic scattering useful for material characterization. Essentially, you when when one shines with a, a definite wavelength or a wavelength of in the visible band, uh, photons from a laser source, uh, we do see two kinds of scattering, the elastic and inelastic, and that the inelastic scattering could be used to determine information about the rotational and electronic energy levels of molecules uh, was first demonstrated experimentally by uh, C.V. Raman. Incidentally, he was at that point of time uh, associated with the Indian Association of the Cultivation of Science. And actually, science was more of his passion than the profession because he was employed at the Auditor General's office, he used to pursue science uh, uh, beyond the office hours. Uh, eventually, of course, uh, Calcutta University uh, recognized and uh, rewarded him with the first Pali chair professorship. But uh, this is an example which inspires the entire scientific and science and technology community in the country that even during the British India, this uh, phenomenal achievement would be made. Uh, today, we actually would like to, as I said, uh, uh, like previous years, would like to celebrate this day uh, on behalf of the Indian National Academy of Engineering. And we are very uh, fortunate to have uh, Professor Uday B. Desai delivering his uh, uh, Science Day lecture on innovations, entrepreneurship, and creating an ecosystem. Uh, this is all about the translational aspect of science and uh, leading to innovations, which is not necessarily a fundamental discovery or 
uh, completely a new invention, but value addition to the existing knowledge base, leading to innovation and progress of the existing uh, level of the engineering exploit. Uh, this is also the time when the country is uh, very much seized with the uh, with the uh, drive for entrepreneurship. And Professor Des Desai is going to talk about that. I also uh, would consider this to be a privilege to introduce. Uh, our good friend uh, and colleague, Professor Uday Desai. He's a, everyone knows him. He's a very uh, eminent and a leading Indian academician who we all know was the founding director of IIT Hyderabad and uh, really took this newly formed IIT to a, a very eminent level of achievement within 10 years of his tenure. He is credited to have uh, taken to not only within the top 10 institutions in the country through NIRF ranking, he also created or sowed the seed of uh, research and innovation uh, in this uh, newly formed IIT. Besides, he was also the uh, mentor director of the IIT Vilai and also uh, served the same role for Triple IIT Chitor. Um, Mr. Desai received his undergraduate engineering degree from IIT Kanpur in 1974 and MS from Sunny Buffalo in 1976 and PhD from John Hopkins USA in 1979, uh, all in electrical engineering. His research interests are, are in wireless communication, wireless sensor networks, cyber physical systems, Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. Uh, he has guided uh, a large number, over two dozen PhDs, uh, over 300 publications, and enjoys very high level of citation uh, for his phenomenal work. He's uh, uh, been the vice president of INE and uh, for the last couple of years, uh, also serves as a professor emeritus at IIT Hyderabad. He's the chancellor of Anurag University, chancellor of Iqfai University, Dehradun. He's also an advisor to several engineering institutions in the country. He's recipient of the Outstanding Alumni Award from Sunny Buffalo and Distinguished Alumni Award from IIT Kanpur. Uh, we all are uh, very keen to hear from Professor Desai his uh, concept and his roadmap as to how India can uh, turn gradually into a major engineering innovation hub with a lot of new entrepreneurship, uh, which will place India into the technological self-reliance map very firmly. So over to you, Uday. So first of all, thank you very much, Professor Manna, for a very nice introduction. And uh, what I would like to mention to all the participants, let me see if I can get this full screen going. Yeah. I hope uh, the full screen is visible clearly to everyone. Yes, sir. Yeah, good. So uh, uh, what I would like to mention is Professor Manna gave a very scholarly uh, background for Science Day and talked about uh, various uh, things related to it. My uh, uh, talk is, as, as was mentioned by Professor Manna, more related to the translational part of it. And it is actually directed towards, I would say, the younger audience. And I hope there are a lot of youngsters who have logged in today, you know, people... Uh, who are seniors like of my generation, you know, they don't need to know much about what I'm saying. Perhaps they're all aware of what I'm going to say out here. Maybe my packaging might be a little different. Okay. So let what I'll do is I'll take a this is more like a, a session on storytelling rather than giving an academic lecture. Okay. So that's not the motivation. You know, it's 10 a.m. in the morning and science day. So Okay, so what I'll do is I'll start with some very simple examples and kind of look at just to give you an idea uh, as to how uh, you know people go about innovations. You know there are some very uh, simple innovations which have had phenomenal impact. Okay, and there are some very high level innovations which are still waiting to have an impact in society. So I'll look at a few such examples. Okay, and then talk about certain other examples in India also. Okay. The first one, which I always like to talk about, is this Velcro. It is also pervasive. All of us use it in one form or the other. There is hardly anybody who does not have something at home or when they travel, which does not have Velcro on it. You know, and, and this is a very interesting story in some sense. 
uh, it was uh, developed by this uh, Swiss engineer, George D. Mestra. Okay. And the interesting, and how did he get this idea? Okay. So everybody, things come from the lab, but also things come from the world that we live in. You know, he used to go hunting in the Alps. Okay. And typically what happened, there is, you know, a, a furry little kind of a ball. When we also go hiking in the mountains, in the woods and all that sticks to our pants, our shirts, etc. We normally throw it out. Okay. And kind of pull it up, little irritation and throw it out. What Mestra did was said that, hey, how come this particular thing is sticking to my shirt or to my pant? He went back to his lab. Now the lab comes in the picture. He actually looked at it. And what you see on the right hand side is the picture of that furry little bog, ball under a microscope. And you can see it has small hooks on it. And using this idea, he developed what we call today Velcro. Of course, it was patented in 55. You know, that's when the patent got granted. You know, the 78, the patent expired. So usually, you know, you do something when the patent is there, but then you have to pay a huge royalty. But once the patent expired, okay, Velcro became all pervasive and particularly Taiwan, China, South Korea developed so much of it. You know, it's all over the place. Even in India, we developed some of it. Okay. So it's an interesting thing. And he had a nice statement, which is quite interesting. Most CEOs will not like to say something. He says, if any of your employees ask for a two week holiday to go hunting, say yes. Okay. So sometimes, you know, taking time off can actually lead to great innovations. The other thing coming back to India, and this is something I always talk about. It's very simple, but the social impact has been absolutely phenomenal. It's the Jaipur foot. You know, I myself have visited the Jaipur foot factory a few years ago, and it was one of the most humbling experience of my life. You know, there are some pictures out here. My experience was there was this, uh, you know, guy who was probably 45 or something, stocky little fellow, you know, looked like Maradona. And suddenly taps on my shoulder and says, you know, come here. Okay. I said, okay. So what he did was he ran across the hall. And I said, hey, this is fantastic. And of course, everybody does. Then he sat down on a chair and pulled off both the artificial feet. Okay. That Jaipur foot had supplied. Basically, he was amputated on both the legs. And with the Jaipur foot, he was literally able to run. You know, I'm not talking about jogging. He was actually able to run. And what you see here is a picture of people able to climb a tree. So very simple invention, a very simple innovation has had phenomenal impact on people's life. Okay. So these are the things we should keep in mind. And this is not very complicated. And the sort of a, a, a anecdote there is then I told these people, like a typical IIT professor, I said, hey, why don't you use 3D printing? Okay, and you can do much better. You can tailor make things for every individual. He said, sir, we'll definitely like to do that. But can you develop this Jaipur, this foot under 2000 rupees using 3D printing? Obviously, that's not going to happen. It's much more expensive than that. You know, so again, cost considerations also become very important when you talk about innovation. The other one, a bit of a plug. This is something we didn't work, did never get to the market. That's the first thing I've said. There is a professor at IIT Hyderabad called Shiv Govin Singh, and he had a lab on a chip for testing COVID. You know, rather than going through the RT-PCR, in 15 minutes, you can get this particular thing done, or even less than 15 minutes. The good part was CCMB at, uh, uh, in Hyderabad did all the testing and showed that the system does work. But then getting approval for this was a nightmare. And by the time something happened, of course, COVID is no longer there. So the utility of this became much less. I think it still can be used. It's not an expensive thing. It's a lab on a chip. You do the testing. You put a little bit of saliva on it, you know, and stick it into this particular uh, 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 box out here. Let me get a little more of a laser pointer thing going. Yeah. In this particular part. And immediately on your cell phone, you can see the results. Okay. But it never made it to the market. So the, the key thing, the reason I'm mentioning this is there are a large number of such innovations in India, particularly, uh, which never make it to the market. Taking to the market is something profoundly different than innovating and actually even creating a product. Okay, So this is one such example that if you are going to be an innovator, if you are going to be you know, working on entrepreneurship, be prepared for failures. Okay, They are perhaps more common than successes, though we only talk about successes. The other one which I like is CT scan. You know, the, today CT scans are all pervasive. And so the British engineer Godfrey Hounsfield, you know, his he started you know not for what CT scan is used today. 
you know, he wanted to study the Egyptian pyramids by, you know, by having cosmic rays go through them and see what is inside the pyramid that your naked eye cannot see. And that was his objective when he started working on this particular part. Okay. And he held on to this idea, worked on it for a long time as to how you can look inside a box. And there is no other way of penetrating the box except using some kind of uh, uh, X-rays, for example. Okay. Ultimately, what he figured out and what works today is this uh, CT scan, the computer tomography imaging, which is there. And today, practically, in, at least in the metros, you know, every big street has one lab which will probably have a CT scan scanner, which will do CT scan for you. So you start somewhere, okay, have a great idea, hold on to it for a long time. You never know when it will fructify. And eventually it may find application in a domain which you had not dreamt of it earlier. Okay, so that's another thing about innovation, you know, that the long gestation periods, starting somewhere else, ending somewhere else. Then the la one, before I come to some other things, you know, one thought, you know, is science, you know, after all this science day, what is fundamentally to me science is injecting new thought into society. You know, for example, quantum theory, absolutely, you know, non-intuitive, you know, Newtonian mechanics, after a while, one feels, oh, it is intuitively, you know, you can understand what is happening. Quantum theory is absolutely non-intuitive, injected a profoundly new thought. And to even today, not everybody will appreciate that. Those who are into deep into science will appreciate. Relativity is one such thing. Thermodynamics, you know, talk about Carnot efficiency. You know, that is difficult to kind of explain that, hey, here is an upper bound. There is a limit. You can't do better than that. You know, people feel, oh, I can keep doing better and better. But no, okay. Discovery of the four fundamental forces, you know, again, the science part of it, how to unify them. Some work has been done, a lot more, theory of evolution. And two pictures I have on the side, one is the IBM quantum computer, of course, probably a hundred qubit one. And the one which is developed at IIC Bangalore, on the left happens to be my former student, Chetan Singh Thakur, and right is Vibhor Singh. And the PI out there is uh, uh, Apurva Patel, you know, former graduate of IIT Bombay. Okay. And now they'll be, they are going to be working on something like a 25 bit uh, quantum computer, you know, that's the next level. And with the quantum mission, hopefully India will actually compete with what IBM is doing. Okay. Now, just a rough progression, since we are on the science day, we are looking at translational work and translational research. That's what my talk is being focused on. You know, you had the first industrial revolution, there were fundamental things in science, steam engine, everything changed. Second industrial revolution, electricity. Electricity was something like magic, you know, on a lighter vein, if I give an anecdote, when the, when Edison first developed his bulb in the US, by the way, people would use a matchstick to start the bulb, by the way, and every motel and hotel or wherever it was used, they used to have big signs that don't do that. There is a switch on the wall on the left hand side, etc. Just flick it and the light will come on. So initially, you know, what something we take for granted was something very unique, very different. And now the steam engine combined with electricity, it revolutionized everything. Of course, the next one was computers, created huge revolutions. Okay. And now what we are living through is the fourth industrial revolution, cyber physical systems, you know, governed by things like artificial intelligence, blockchain, IoT, quantum computing, you know, AI, and the AI also generative AI, which is being talked about, AI agents, whatnot. Okay. And I think the future is like, you know, as I keep saying here, you know, that uh, 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 the brave new world that we are entering today. Now, one thing, whenever I give this talk, I, this is more of a, a homage to uh, Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, and I would like to display this particular slide. You know, everything that we have today in information age and whatever we are talking about, the genesis of that goes to Claude Shannon. Obviously, transistor has played a big role, no doubt about it, but the fundamentals are all laid by him. And it is the reason I mention is, of course, you know, respecting Claude Shannon, but more that, you know, a simple question that he took up, you know, he spent all his time answering one question. How can I mathematically calculate information in a signal? That's it. You know, in his, you know, he normally in his biography, when you listen to it, you know, or, or, or some audio tapes are there, video tapes are there on YouTube. He says that, you know, I, in his time, if someone gave, and I'm paraphrasing it and right, saying it differently, if there was a bit of, say, uh, uh, gasoline in a test tube, the mathematically I could tell what is the energy content in that particular, uh, uh, say, 100 ml of uh, gasoline. But if I saw a signal on the oscilloscope, there was no way for me to tell mathematically what is the information content in that signal. 
he developed the whole thing bits and bytes came into picture and now these words like bits and bytes are so common that you know anybody on the street also uses those words it become that way and he brought in this whole role of uncertainty obviously in information theory uncertainty was known earlier in quantum physics and probability theory but bringing it into uh, uh, engineering and that was a big thing and information theory of course internet there are many fathers for the internet i have listed some of them i won't spend time repeating their names and you can even look it up on the web okay where are we headed Okay, so this is just a brief background and now look at where are we going, what is happening with us, you know. So we are living in a world which is highly connected, you know, exploding connectivity, large number of sensors, okay. I think we are just beginning to get into it, more and more sensors are going to come. You know, for example, if you go back even 20-30 years, people were sensitive about getting the picture taken, the face image. Today, we have forgotten about it. Wherever you go, you are being videographed. Okay. And all of us are very happy having Digi Atra, my face recognition, zoom, I go through the airport. Okay. And you know, the, suddenly everything has changed. The whole technology has changed. This whole perception that was that my face image was some, there is a degree of privacy to it. That privacy is gone today. I mean, I can't think of a single place except my home perhaps where there is not a video camera. Even the society I live in, the elevator has a video camera in it. Okay. So it's all pervasive. So sensors are going to come in more and more. And I think many of us will be having sensors. For example, many of you have smart watches, which has multiple sensors. And you are, it's like a band on your hand, which is taking care of your heartbeat, you know, your temperature, et cetera, et cetera. So these sort of things are going to become all pervasive. In fact, the other day I was chatting, just two days ago, one of my colleagues who is heavily diabetic, and uh, he was giving a shot to himself, you know, just before meals. And now we are going to have a patch. At least lab level, it is already there. I think commercially, I'm not sure what is the status. You put a patch of that on your shoulder, okay? okay. And slowly and slowly, the insulin will be injected into your body. Okay. So you don't have to take a shot, don't have to have a, a big dose of insulin, exactly in whatever measured quantity and the slow seepage into your system will happen, which is much more comfortable than taking shots. You know. The things which are going to play very big roles are, you know, AI, data analytics, etc, etc. So just hold on to that. Now this is, you know, I'm an electrical engineer working more in communication, signal processing, some aspects of computer science, etc. So this is my biased view of technologies that are going to impact you. I'm sure people in some other disciplines would like to add more boxes. That's why the last box is dot, dot, dot. It's not a, by no means this particular uh, 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 sequence of boxes are complete. Generative AI, not just AI, that's going to become very, very big out here. You know, general intelligence, I put it in an orange color. You know, it is not there. People are saying it will come. We don't know whether it will come or not. There is a fear of general intelligence also that they may go beyond what we are doing. Things like data science, cyber physical system, I'll talk a little bit more about it, semiconductors. You know, they were very big. Again, it went through a little quiet phase and now suddenly semiconductors have become very big. You know, I mean, Japan is having some two big plants for uh, chip design, chip manufacturing set up by TSMC. US is having a big plant being set up by TSMC, you know. Earlier, it was only TSMC. Now, every country is trying. India has a big semiconductor mission. And we also want to have fabrication facilities in our country today. And not just design. Design, of course, we have been doing it. So, semiconductors are going to play a bigger and bigger role in time to come. 6G, I'll briefly talk a bit about that. You know, quantum computing, blockchain, cyber security. All of us hear that every day. We get enough SMSs and WhatsApp messages. Metaverse, you know, people talk about digital humans. You know, artificial humans, art, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, etc. Smart mobility is coming into picture. Okay, it's happening all over the place. And I'll talk a little bit about smart mobility in the next few slides after this one. The other big thing which has been going on for a long time and in some sense closely related to the current generative AI is natural language processing. You know, LLMs, you know, large language models, use a lot of natural language processing. And what has happened is, Earlier, if you look at science, you know, the, the things that Professor Manna talked about, they were driven by certain theoretical work and the verification took much later. He cited, I cited one example of Einstein's work. Okay, it took 100 years to verify. Now everything is data-driven science, you know, data-driven technologies. So it's not, you know, the models come because of data. 
the whole of AI in some sense is a data driven technology and data plays a very important natural language processing is one big scientific area. I call it scientific because there is a lot of science also involved in it besides technology, engineering and technology, but it is predominantly data driven. You know, so that's why the, the theory comes a little later. Another thing which I feel is going to be very big next to semiconductors, of course, is neuromorphic computing. There are several people across the globe working on in India also. Uh, as I mentioned, my, Ketan Singh Thakur is working on developing a neuromorphic chip. Amit Acharya at IIT Hyderabad is developing neuromorphic chip. These are two I'm aware of. I'm sure there are many other people at IITs, IISCs, ICERs, mm -hmm. you know, who are working on these sort of things. Advanced materials, that is not my domain out here. Okay, Professor Manna is a lot more into it. I think that is playing a big role in some form. You need materials for anything that you want to do, be it semiconductors or like I talked about various patches that I have to develop, which will be stuck on my skin for various medical reasons. Materials will come in and all over the place, you know. So it's a very big area. Okay. I'm not saying much because that is not my domain of expertise. IoT, we all talk about it today. Even your taxi driver, auto driver will have heard the word IoT. 3D printing. It took off with a big bang. Somehow it has become a little slow. You know, I think I, I'd expected by now 3D printing to be all pervasive, but for some reason it is not quite taking off the way one had anticipated. Hopefully it will do that. The other big thing, and at the end of my talk, I'll mention a little bit about it, is CRISPR-Cas9, the gene editing. This is the huge technology coming from biological sciences, which is going to have a massive impact on society. I think India is not quite appreciating what this can do. I think we need to do a lot more. And my feeling is gene editing combined with AI is going to be a potent technology with its pluses and minuses. Sensors, the other big thing which everybody talks about because of climate change is clean energy. All like yesterday only I had a colleague where I was chatting with him and they are working on geothermal energy. They're putting up geothermal plants in the United States and that will be clean energy. You know, not just even to uh, uh, manufacture green hydrogen, you need a clean source of energy. And he says that this geothermal plant will be the clean source of energy and it will be an end to end clean cycle, even if you're looking at hydrogen. Space technology. Huge, of course, we are very proud of what Tisura has done and a lot more can be done out here. The other thing which is coming up, this is beginning, I'm just getting aware of it. Uh, first time I heard was from Hari Balakrishnan, a professor at MIT, it's so-called prompt engineering. You know, with chat GPT and the whole, the way the world is changing, you can't write paragraphs. How do you frame a question properly so you get a good answer from your computer or from your AI agent? You know, so essentially this has become a topic now. There are courses and maybe, you know, at in US, Okay, with the talk, they will teach you about prompt engineering. And I'm just looking at it right now. I'm trying to understand what is involved in terms of uh, from a deep engineering perspective, not just the intuitive perspective. But it's interesting that suddenly, you know, small phrases and small questions and how to frame them is more important rather than giving big talks that what I'm doing right now. Autonomous AI agents are going to come in. So currently, chat GPT is something that you give a prompt, you talk to it, and some answer comes out. Autonomous agent would be that I will have a robot, I'll equip with generative AI into it, okay, and that agent will now go out into the field, you know, be it a shop floor or be it a big warehouse, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, and it will do its thing on its own. I don't have to keep monitoring it, keep telling it, you know, bit risky, bit dangerous, and it has a lot of other societal repercussions, we can discuss that some other time, but that's a very interesting area that is coming, and there are many more other technologies. You know, how much time do I have, uh, Colonel Rai? I think I may be... Why do they, uh, another 20 minutes? Okay, fine. Okay. Now, 20, cyber 20, physical 20 systems, okay, I'll just briefly mention, uh, this is a very broad structure. You know, if you look at your typical communication, like mobile communication, it's, an, it's basically open loop communication. You know, I talk, like what is happening right now, it's an open loop communication. I talk, you listen, I display a slide, slide you see a slide. There is no feedback. Moment you close the loop, you get a cyber physical system. So suddenly, you know, topic in my, I remember in the 70s and early 80s, control was very big, feedback control. And as my colleague, you know, Bob Skelton would joke sometimes, he said, with feedback control, you can take a donkey, give proper feedback to it and make it behave like an Arabian horse. Okay, I mean, that's what feedback control does. Okay. But uh, uh, I think that is now coming into picture. So suddenly you find combination of communication and control co coming together and creating this whole world called cyber physical system and of course AI, signal processing, all the other things will come into picture out here. 
Okay. There are many examples. So these are the components of what a cyber physical system will have. You know, sensing will be very big. Communication, computing, of course, AI is a new thing which is coming. Initially, when it started, AI was, you know, AI was in its winter because CPS is around for almost 20 years, by the way. It's not something very new. In India, we are getting into it a little later. We should have done it a lot earlier. Okay. Uh, I'll just briefly mention about India's initiative also. And control is now is the new component which is coming into it. Okay. But I think large number of systems, for example, applications are all over. Aircraft, actually aerospace industries have been using CPS without calling it CPS for a very long time. It takes me a bit of time to explain, so I'll skip it. Biomedical is getting into it, the things that I mentioned. Agriculture is going to be a big recipient of cyber physical systems. Automobiles, you know, vehicle to vehicle communication, vehicle to infrastructure communication, with feedback, very big. Autonomous drones, structural health, and many more other disciplines. I've just given a few pictures out here to give a perspective on where uh, cyber physical systems can be used. Practically, it can be used in any aspects of society and technology which impacts society. You know, I'll just talk about a cyber physical system in the context of the CPS initiative of India. So uh, uh, India launched this a few years ago, about four years ago, this national mission on interdisciplinary cyber physical system, TNA. And there are uh, some 23, uh, I think 25 hubs have been established in the country. And I was the first scientific uh, advisor to the committee, which actually reviewed all the proposals. There are hundreds of proposals that we went through. Finally, we selected 25 hubs, practically all IITs, many ICERs, you know, uh, BITS, Pilani, IIIT, Hyderabad, etc. They all have uh, uh, the hub. Some IITs don't have it. Most of them do have it. You know, I think IIIT Bangalore also has it. So what I'm going to talk about is the hub at IIT Hyderabad, which is called THAN, Technology Innovation Hub for Autonomous Navigation. It is funded under the NMICPS project, which is a national level project. It was about a 3,600 crore initiative. I think several installments have been given and more and more. And the chair of the mission governing board is Chris Gopal Krishnan. So we had tremendous guidance and uh, uh, know-how coming from someone at the level of Chris also in setting up this hub and getting the hubs operational. So this is, uh, 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 you can see the autonomous car, which has been developed at IIT Hyderabad. So what it does, it drives automatically. A moment it senses there's a person out there, it stops and also honks. Okay, All kinds of things are being done out here. Okay, So this is basically an example of a cyber physical system. There are sensors out here, LIDARs and all, which have been set up. We have a point cloud, you do reconstruction on the fly. Okay, currently these autonomous vehicles are, are operating at about 10 to 20 kilometers per hour. Okay, and what you see on the right hand side with the Tihan logo on it, this is the big hangar which has been developed at IIT Hyderabad, and this is a test bed for testing of vehicles out here in an autonomous manner. Okay. Here is another example. This is the test bed that you can see where there are two vehicles. Okay, the stops at the stoplight. The second vehicle also comes and stops, and on top you can see you know there are lots of all these electronics. In fact, the cost of all the sensors and the electronics is perhaps much more than the cost of the car. Okay. These are other, other things which are there. They are looking at autonomous, you know, uh, bio-inspired uh, uh, drones, tiny ones. And this can have tremendous defense applications, by the way. Okay, so this is the inside of that uh, Tihan building that I showed you in the previous picture. Uh, this is a big, uh, what you call, uh, uh, hangar which we have out there. Okay. Uh, this is again looking at passenger drone and some testing is going on. It is not flying. The drone is being hung from top and then, then you know, all the movement that are there, how to balance it out, etc. That work is being going on out here. You know, so again, you can see in the hangar, the kind of work that is going on in developing a passenger drone. Again, idea being it will be a, a, a autonomous drone and not a manned drone. Let me move to engine, uh, communication. Of course, a lot is there. Uh, I'm not going to get into detail. Uh, this is a short talk. There's one aspect which I wanted to emphasize out here. You know, people talk about 5G. Now we are into 5G advanced or 5G plus. 6G is coming in, et cetera, et cetera. 3GPP, okay, the third generation uh, uh, partnership uh, program. They are the ones who kind of control all the, how your telecommunication is going to work. You know? So various other components are there out here. I'm not going through that. Okay. What I think is going to happen in future, this is a broad thing about 5G, 6G and satellite communication, one generic map. You know, you have ground 
based communication from ground towers, from satellite, it is also happening. This backhaul from the ground, this backhaul from satellite, etc. This is what we are working on. We are all recipient of this. This is operational in technically right now. You know, our 5G phones or 4G phones are essentially using this wherever you are. Okay, but what is going to come, and in some sense, it has already come, is what people call as cube sites. You know, these are tiny satellites, approximately 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10, 10 centimeter cube. Okay, so it's a very tiny one, you know, 10 centimeter cube. That's all it is. And there are a large number of such satellites already tossed into space, by the way. And the whole idea being that we will not essentially the way we have cellularized terrestrial area, you know, there are cell towers all over the place. You can see them. These we will essentially cellularize space. So what you see on the uh, these are you can think of this as cell towers or base stations, okay, in space. Each of the satellite would act like that. So there is handoff between the satellites that is taking place, and also handoff between mobile phones on the ground to this one. And the whole notion of roaming will change profoundly, okay. Once uh, uh, we have this particular situation, okay. And what is of concern? Starlink, you know, everybody has heard of Elon Musk. He has this big company called Starlink. And you, you might have heard that even in the Ukraine war and all, uh, Elon Musk was trying to provide the Starlink uh, uh, technology for uh, internet and uh, various other communication facilities. Okay. It is operational, by the way. It is working very well. I know some of my colleagues in the US who have something like a countryside house and there is no fiber coming out there. So rather than using copper, they're able to get much better internet speed and much better access by deploying or by installing Starlink, that is Elon Musk technology. What was shocking to me, you know, I gave this talk at ISRO and when I was looking at it is 4,500 satellites, in, uh, active satellites in the world are controlled by one company called Starlink and essentially one person, Elon Musk, and which is approximately 50% of all the satellites, active satellites in space out here. Now, can you imagine, you know, 50% of active satellites, large and small, okay. Of course, most of them are small satellites because for telecom, they don't need this big satellite which are there, okay. And you're talking about low Earth orbiting satellites out here, LEO satellites, but they're controlled by one company. Now, you can imagine what's going to happen tomorrow. It's going to be so difficult for anybody to enter. And in fact, my uh, 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 sort of comment to Dr. Radhakrishnan, you know, who was the former chair of... Uh, uh, Isro, I said, look, sir, he says, yes, we are working on CubeSats, but of course, you know, one needs to go much faster. Okay, maybe they should do in collaboration with IITs and uh, 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 ICERs and others. You know. The other thing which is really, you know, I mean, sometimes we say that how we are doing it, you know, US is far ahead in terms of what it thinks. You know, they are talking about interplanetary internet. And I learned about it. I was listening to a talk by Winton Cerf about a year ago. You know, and he says that, and that was just around the time when we landed our rover on the moon. Okay, and he then he gave a talk. So he says that when the first rover, the U.S. rover, landed on Mars, he took a flight from California, that is from sorry from San Jose area to to uh, uh, Pasadena. He went to JPL area. All the communication units were at JPL, and he talked to them, saying, "How are you communicating with this rover on Mars?" He says, because I want to now develop interplanetary internet. He's been working on it for more than 20 years. This was around 98, 99 when he started, almost 25 years. Still, success has been eluding him because the delays and all the latencies are too high right now and unable to overcome it. Okay, But the purpose of this particular slide is that many a times a nation has to invest in long-term thinking. Okay, and not something where I will get the fruits tomorrow or a year after or two years after. You know, 25 years, of course, private parties have been investing, government has been investing, and he's still working on it. You know, he, Winton Surf is one of the fathers of the internet, you know, along with many others, the names that I had earlier. Now, gene editing. Okay, this I think is very big. They, you know, I used to talk about it. And what happened was, uh, uh, I think in 2023, 20, just not too far, December 8, 2023, FDA approved CRISPR-based treatment for sickle cell disease. Now, this is quite revolutionary. Okay, sickle cell diseases are you know, almost like terminal diseases, very difficult to get out of it. Okay, it's a genetic problem. And now they are saying you can cure that, treat that using CRISPR by doing gene editing. 
uh, I, I have to look it up and find out which are the patients who have benefited from this particular treatment. But FDA in the US has approved it. In India, we are very, very slow on takeoff. And you know, I was talking to some of my colleagues at CCMB in Hyderabad, and they're saying, yes, sir, we are doing some work. You know, definitely CRISPR is a big thing, but we are moving slowly because of various regulatory constraints and all. But if FDA is approving it, why can't we go in a much bigger manner? And I'm not an expert in that domain, but I can see the value of and then the impact that this technology is going to have on healthcare. Okay, so I'll just quickly talk about it. You know, I mean, of course, most of entrepreneurship is related to digital economy. Okay, so this is rough what I'm mentioning out here, how many internet you. Okay. So if you look at, you know, we talk about a huge startup system in India, we still have a long way to go. It's just a comparison. If you look at the investment in total funding from 14 to 21, US is $1.1 trillion. I mean, it's mind boggling. China, more than half a trillion dollars. We are still about $100 billion. I mean, a lot more is required. I mean, let's face it. Entrepreneurship does not work only on innovation. You need investments. And huge investments are required out here. I think we still have a long way to go out here. If you look at within the country, I mean, this data is well known. You know, I think Karnataka, of course, that is because of Bangalore leads, Delhi NCR in terms of number of startups. We do have, but we, you know, my uh, concern is that deep tech startups are not that many. They are very few in the country. You know, we have a large number of sort of, you know, me to tech kind of startups out here. You know, I, would, I would call, for example, uh, uh, Flipkart is a me to technology. I mean, though Ola, you know, started by a student from IIT Bombay. I mean, he knew me. You know, I think I taught him something out here, Bhavesh. Okay. Again, it's me to technology, you know, but fundamental uh, deep tech startups are very few. Okay. Partly because, you know, we, it's not easy to get investments in deep tech innovative startups from the Indian startup ecosystem or the Indian venture capital ecosystem. The US just take that risk and invest things, you know, where it may work, it may not work. So very quickly, what can academic do? This is something which many academics are doing very standard out here. The only two, three things that I like to add out here besides the first three bullets is, you know, you need guidance for sales and marketing. If you have a startup in an IIT system, technology is no brainer. You know, there are enough people who know the technology. There are enough who can develop that technology. Also convert it into some kind of a workable solution. No problem. Market access. As I mentioned, it is not easy to sell something. It's very, very hard. Now, how do we create that ecosystem in our incubators? And the, every IIT has one incubator. Okay, I think even ICERs are having incubators now. Okay, NITs are having incubators. Now, how do we inculcate this aspect? And by the way, not all engineers have this particular know-how. It, it, it is a specialized skill, you know, how to sell something. The other thing we don't do is reliability and robustness testing. You know, in our case, if something works and it works for a short while, we are happy with it. Roll it out. It doesn't work. You know, you buy products. Why? Because they are reliable. You know, for a few years, they will work without failure. If I buy a car, I don't want my car to break down every three, four, six months and a brand new car. At least for the first five years, I want it to run smoothly. All I need to do is put petrol in it, annual maintenance, that is just change of oil, filter, etc. And it should work well. So that comes because of robustness. We have not inculcated this culture of robustness and reliability. The other culture we have not inculcated is ergonomics, design. You know, in our case, many times you can see the product, they look so, you know, not very unwieldy. You, know, you buy things because they, are, they give you a good look and feel also. And that comes from the design department. And I'm not talking of mechanical design. This is creative design. IDC at IID Bombay, for example, does a lot of that. Okay. So I think we need to incorporate this. Aesthetics is very, very important when you buy a pro product. And it has to look good, feel good. Then only you're going to buy it. And I think that emphasis currently is quite often missing in many incubators. I'm not saying all of them. Many of the incubators, that is missing. The other thing I've had is take low equity, you know. There are some IITs I know of, they charge 10 to 12 percent equity. That is too high in my opinion. Frankly, I would say it should be no more than 3 percent, hopefully less than 3 percent. I think goodwill is perhaps the biggest equity that we can have. You know, one has to look at it from a larger domain. You know, we want to make money even before the company kind of has the first sale. That doesn't happen. Okay. So I think that has to be one of the driving principles because I've seen there are some incubators which have done well, have taken low equity, but some are taking too much equity in my opinion. 
give free space for the beginning. You know, many times when the students or the young entrepreneurs want to start something, they don't have even money to pay the rent for that particular space. And if you look at it, most incubators in the country at IITs, NITs, etc., you know, essentially it's like a real estate model. You know, how much rent can I charge? And I get some. You know, my feeling is that uh, uh, at least for six months, give them free space, maybe even a year. I mean, I did that when I was the director at IIT Hyderabad. Anybody, any student faculty who wanted to start a company, for six months, the space was free. I think, you know, I'm looking back, I think I should have done it for one year. You know, uh, it's not a problem. I think we need to encourage this. And because those, those days, they don't have any money. They're just living literally hand to foot. And their colleagues or their uh, friends are now working for Google and all these multinationals and drawing, you know, huge salaries out there. So it's a mentally also not a, a very tough thing for them to do entrepreneurship when their colleagues are drawing such huge salaries and traveling or traveling all over the globe. Give access to lab facilities. You know, one of the reasons of having incubators, and many times we are a little restrictive in that, I think that has to be more flexible. There is, there is an incubator incubated in an academic institution. The lab facilities should be made available to the incubator in terms of future whatever, you know, benefits that the uh, incubator give. We don't have to charge them money right then and there. Okay. Facilitate easy technology transfer. Personally, I think academic institutions in India, in IITs, NITs, ISERs, we have huge IP, but it is all kept in cold storage. You know, with the belief that, ah, one of these IP is going to get me a billion dollars. It's not going to happen. Unfreeze that particular IP and give it away. Let these guys use it. Okay. And you have some kind of a model, equity model, royalty model, or a combination of equity and royalty. That one can work it out. And I think that IP has to be unfrozen. Currently, you know, I think it's happening, but very slowly. I think we need to unfreeze it much faster. Yeah. Of course, this has been done in many places. I think most places have it. So I put this bullet out here anyway, but I think this is done that faculty can hold equity and they need not only have consultancy in the startup that happened. Many that is happening in many institutions. Give release time to faculty. And I'll give a, you know, in US it is much with Stanford in particular, if a faculty goes to the dean and says, you know, I need one year release time to have a startup, the dean is quite likely to say that, hey, your startup will need more than one year, take two years time off. Okay. India is just the opposite. You know, another thing we need to give training, and this is something we don't do. I mean, I had a startup and I interact with some of them and then I realized it is legal and compliance. India is very difficult place to work, to have a business out here. Like my, one of my colleague who runs a venture company in Hyderabad says that if you're on a scale of 10, okay, if you put US as nine, as far as the ease of business for startups, India, he says, will be, will be between four and five. Okay. So we have too many compliances. You know, I mean, India is the only country which has angel tax. I don't know if any, uh, US has nothing. No, I mean, when I talk to my colleagues in US, they just have a, huh? they, they say, what do you mean by angel tax? Okay. I mean, you can't encourage entrepreneurship if you're going to have angel tax. So to conclude, I would say, you know, to be an innovator, you need to have a spirit of what if, uninhibited thinking. You know, our thinking is quite often boxed. I think I find many US thinking is quite uninhibited. They can really, we talk about thinking out of the box, but we really don't do. And I can give enough examples to prove my point. Okay, US is much more uh, uh, adventurous when it comes to thinking out of the box. You know, similarly, the second, uh, third bullet basically says the same thing, courage to think differently. We need a strong element of play. I know our education is highly structured. Everything is like, you know, courses, courses, plan this, plan that, you know, we need to keep the people occupied. We need arenas where students and people can play with technology. Okay. The tinkering labs which have come up in all the, or the maker spaces which have come up in many academic institutions. Great. You know, that is an unstructured place where students can play with it. Okay. And, but we need a lot more of that. What we have is just too little for the size of student population, say, we have in IITs. Okay. Like, I, I know IIT Bombay has a big, nice baker space. In fact, I think bulk of it was funded by Himan Kanakya, if I'm not mistaken. It's managed by students, run by students. That's that's the model that should be there. But given the population, the student population, close to 10,000 students on campus, I mean, that is too small a place for playing with technology. Don't worry about failures. Easy to say, hard to digest. Okay. And lastly, whatever one may say, you need a bit of luck. You have to be at the right place at the right time. If you don't have luck, I don't know. <laughs> that one has to worry about it. So you may have everything in place. But, you know, it's like COVID. Everything was there. Many people just lost so much just because of two, two to three years of COVID. 
Now that's beyond you, right? I mean, it's bad luck. That's all one can say. Okay, so I'll stop here and I stopped with my famous sentence from a famous physicist. It's a science day. After all, so I need to quote Freeman Dyson, a person who should have got the Nobel Prize but didn't get it. Dissent is the soul of science. That is this famous statement. I won't spend time explaining it. I'll just leave it out there. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity and I hope the talk was useful to you. Thank you so much, Uday. Uh, absolutely outstanding. And I hope uh, your target audience, the youngsters, have really derived some inspiration and leads from your uh, exposition. So I'll uh, request Colonel Rai to propose. Uh, we don't have the provision of interaction here, Uday, unfortunately, right. in this platform. Uh, but understand. the whole idea was to actually uh, throw certain ideas and see whether we, on behalf of INE, can inspire youngsters into more of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship activities, but firmly entrenched in fundamental science. That's what we said. Okay, so Colonel Rai, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your concluding remarks. Uh, allow me to express my gratitude to Professor Desai, the speaker for today's uh, INE program on the occasion of the National Science Day. Uh, I also thank the attendees, including our esteemed fellows who spared their valuable time in making the today's program a success. Uh, the thoughts uh, left uh, in our minds with the talk shall stay with us, resonate with us. And thank you, sir, for introducing so many, the wide arena of technologies, what you described, including the fourth industrial revolution, all these were a revelation. And of course, the institutional support, which are required to Foster the activity of innovation and entrepreneurship in the country uh, for this uh, 360 degree talk. I am extremely grateful on behalf of INA. Please accept this. Thank you to uh, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, wish you all the best on Science Day to all the Thank participants. you, sir. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you.